Life's three stars, man. We have we a, a living real legend, legend a living, living legend, man. Mr. Free Ray Ricky Ross, man. Uh, the original, the OG, man. Um, it's crazy because as time go on and life goes on, uh, the aura and the stigma of, of a person's name and what they did in life, it just grows big over the years. You know, new kids come into fold. They get to hear about stories from your era bygone. And um, even now, what you're doing now, it just gets uh, crazy. Um, how just, again, your story just gets almost synonymous, synonymous with U.S. history. And uh, let's go and do it like this, man. Um, first and foremost, uh, for those kids that might be deaf, dumb, stupid, living under a big-ass rock, I want you to reintroduce yourself. And uh, as we do, tell them where you're from. Man, what's up, y'all? Freeway Ricky Ross. My mama named me Rick Ross, though, but, uh, you know, I picked up the, the moniker Freeway through my travels through the world. Uh, I'm originally, I was born here in uh, East Texas, Kyler to be exact. Oh, snap. Uh, Tyler, know, Texas. Oh, 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 do, do, Texas. Do people, Texas. yeah, do a lot of people know that? Say. Did you, did you yeah. rep Tyler when you was coming up or were you like quiet about where you were from? No, 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 no. I always, you know, I always loved Tyler. You know, uh, uh, I think some of my, 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 bur my best work ethics come from Tyler, Texas. You know, my, my uncles, uh, Worked real hard down there in the country, you know, oh, all yeah. hay, puck wood, and uh, put up fence and stuff like that there. And, and I used to volunteer every summer to come down and work with them so that I could make some money for, for next year. You know, when I went back to school, I wanted to have a little money in my pocket. So I, I would come down here and I, I give a lot of my, my, my work ethic from, from being from Texas. Definitely. Were you, um, was it your family that got you out to uh, California or? No. Yeah. Um, my mom and my dad broke up when I was four months old. So uh, mom, she said she wanted to find a better life for us. So, uh, you know, Texas was, was racist as hell back then. Oh, man, talk about it. They still had black and white bathrooms in the 60s. Uh, so you were subjected to that to, as far oh, as... Oh, I saw uh, black and white bathrooms. Oh, man. Yeah. So, uh, wait, wait. How old were you when you left uh, to California? Did you go... You went to school out here? No. At all? No, okay. I never went to school in Texas. I left when I was three. Okay, uh, okay. Just, but I came back every summer. Oh, so you see Every it. summer I would come back, you know, because uh, uh, I wanted to work. You know, I wanted to go in the country and, and work with my uncles and make some money. You know, they pay you a dollar a week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds barbaric right now. A dollar a week. You <laughs> said, I got to hustle. Hey, okay. You come down and you work the whole summer, you go back, you got like $15. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you get you a pair of tennis shoes and... You know, some some popcorn and some soda pop. You know, so so it was better than not having nothing. Right. You know, if I would have stayed in California, I wouldn't have had nothing because you know, in Cali, when you was you know eight nine years old, they wouldn't let you work. Right. So did you always had it hustling you like as a kid? Like you know, some kids sell candy at the school or like what did you do? I sold candy at school too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I used to have uh, my, 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 one of my partners, we laughed about it. Uh, matter of fact, that's one of my new projects that I'm working on. Uh, my partner, we used to go to the store and, and we would steal candy out the, out the store. And I had a, a, my pocket, I cut a hole in my pocket so that I could slip the candy in the back of the jacket. So when the teacher tried to find the candy, she couldn't find it. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. She didn't know we had the hole in there. We dropped the candy all the way in the back. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we sold candy at school. I mean, ever since I found out that, you know, you needed money to have to find the things in life, I always wanted some money. Right. And, and I found out early on that, you know, if you don't work, you don't get no money. You know, my uncle, one of my uncles, uh, his name was N.T. And when it, when it come time to eat in the morning, he'd be saying, you don't, you don't work, you don't eat. And, and he meant that. So, and the harder you work, the more extras you get. Right. It's facts. It's facts. That's what's up. So, so paint the scene for in L.A. At what time in L.A. Like, do you did you just get out? Man, there? we moved right, right, right before the Watch Riots. You know, we just got there, and then uh, it's crazy how we got there, and, and the Watch Riots was going on. Uh, so I got to experience the uh, the Black Panther movement. Uh, you know, with the army tanks. Uh, I remember my brother. He didn't move to California with me and my mom when we first. We first moved there because we were sleeping on my auntie's couch, and uh, so my brother stayed back in Tyler with my with my dad. And uh, when, when when mom sent for him to come on out, 
he joined an organization called the Us. It was kind of like the, the Black Panthers and uh, during the riot when the cops slapped him in the, in the, in the mouth and busted his nose. And, uh, uh, and that kind of started a little rift between me and the police because my brother was my guy. You know what I'm saying? You don't hit my guy in the nose and, and, and bust his nose. And, you know, so uh, uh, when I was writing my book and I thought it back to that time and I, I figured that kind of like started the rift between me and, me, and, me and law enforcement. So I always had like a little, a little thing against law enforcement ever since they, uh, they hit Big Bro, you know, like, man, you yeah. hit Big Bro, you know, yeah, yeah, like. Yeah. <laughs> now, growing up at the L.A. scene, there's a lot of gang influence. Were you any, ever get caught up in any of that as a child or did you, were you ever involved in that type of thing? Well, the gangs came around, I started noticing the gangs around 69. Okay. When, when I first noticed the Crips. Um, it was during a school day. You know, all the kids, we in class and we just, you know, doing the regular classroom thing. And then when the kids walked to the window and they was like, wow, look at all these guys. And so the whole classroom went to the window and then we see like a hundred guys with blue on and blue rags. And, and somebody said, man, them the Crips. And I had never heard of Crip, had never seen a Crip, uh, but I was fascinated. You know, when I got out of class, I walked by and I looked. And, you know, investigated. And my fascination with Crippen started from that day. Uh, a couple of my friends that I went to school with, you know, uh, which is one of my new projects that I'm working on right now. I'm working on a documentary that we're gonna call The Evolution of Crippen. Yeah. And like these are three guys that went to school with me, elementary school. Uh, they turned Crips. I wanted to become a Crip, but my mom, you know, my mom was from East Texas, so, you know. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were they had the telephone card, the extension card, tree branch, you know, it didn't matter what it was. You was gonna get hit with something. Oh, right. <laughs> so uh, you know, when I was twelve years old, I wanted to, but uh, like I said, mom wasn't going for it. When I turned twelve and a half, thirteen, somebody put a tennis racket in my hand. So uh <clears throat> my love switched from 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 wanting to be a gang member to uh becoming a tennis player. And real quick, what was uh what was the stigma of gang members in like 69, 70 and things like that? Like what was their stigma um as far as what were they in your eyes as a kid? Like what did they mean to the well, community? Well they wasn't it wasn't like it became, you know, you know, we didn't have gang killings, you know, it wasn't wasn't none of that at first. It was more like I, I remember when the Crips and the Bloods just played football in the park. Oh man. Yeah, yeah they just played dope. football against each other, you know, the Bloods would come over and they would have their teams, and, and, and uh, I remember the first time that one got killed in the park. You know, uh, somebody, I wasn't there when the killing happened, but you know, I heard the stories. They say one hit, hit the other one in the mouth with an elbow, uh, knocked his teeth out. The one that got his tooth knocked out, went to his car, got his, his 12 gauge shotgun out, chased him, chased him down, and, and, and blasted him, and killed him. And that started the war between uh, the Swans and, and the Hoovers. And the war just, you know, over time, it just kept escalating and escalating. But I did want to be a Crip. I did want to, but uh, like I said, when I started playing tennis, I lost all desire. Uh, and, and I kind of like left the hood a little bit. You know, I, I lived in South Central, but I stayed on the tennis court. So I would be in, in, in uh, West LA, Beverly Hills, UCLA. I would be at all these places where they play tennis at during the daytime, <clears throat> I only went home to sleep. So I would get up at seven in the morning and I would be gone from the hood all day, literally. And I'm curious, um, you know, the world got introduced to, of course, with King Richard, with Will Smith, uh, as far as kids playing tennis in LA with uh, Venus and Serena. And uh, that was a life that you were actually part of um, as far as doing early on. What was it about that as far as, you know, that you were gravitated towards tennis? Most, he said football, you know, other things. Like what was that for you? I, I played that. football and basketball and baseball. I played all the sports, but by me being a little guy, when uh, when it was time for the coaches to come and, and recruit for high school, uh, nobody recruited me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just gravitated on the tennis because uh, the tennis coach did recruit me. I did get recruited by the tennis coach, so uh, I gravitated to tennis. And then you know, tennis guys, 
were getting more free stuff at that time. You know, like we used to get Nike tennis shoes for free and, and we didn't want to wear them. You know, Reeboks, we used to get all those tennis shoes for free and all we wanted to wear were Converse at, and the Adidas at that time. Uh, so I saw the benefits of playing tennis at an early age. You know, uh, we got exposure. You know, we would be in, in, in ritzy neighborhoods, uh, getting to play against rich kids. Uh, uh, instead of, you know, with football, they mostly played with rival schools inside the ghetto. So it gave me a lot of exposure to a lot of different things. <clears throat> were you, were How you, black people was playing tennis? Uh, at that time, it was it was it was really rare for blacks. Uh, we only had we only had two pros at that time. It was Arthur Ashe and another guy by by the name of Lawrence King Cornbread, uh, who was a really Cornbread was a really good friend of mine. Whenever he came off the circuit, he would always come to my high school, pick me up, and and take me and uh, and work out with me, uh, which gave me a, a great advantage over a lot of other people because uh, when you get to play at a high level like that, it always helps your game go up. Oh, well, you ain't good at tennis, though. It was pretty good. You know, I, I beat Cornbread one time. <laughs> <laughs> now, having the exposure to, you know, when you over here, you're in the hood. But when you're over here, you're seeing this much different lifestyle. What did that do for your mentality? Well, I, I think one of the things is, that it did for me, and, and, and I'm able to use that right now, is it allowed me to function in both, in both communities. You know, I can function inside the hood. But then I also could go to Beverly Hills and function inside of Beverly Hills, which a lot of people can't do. They can't cross sector, and, and, and um, I do that pretty good. Now, you know, there's, there's the whole talk about, you know, you know, Free Ray Ricky, you know what I'm saying? You are a legend. You're the myth. You know what I'm saying? They have a whole show named Snowfall that is depicted, they say, on your life. You know what I mean? And, um... I think I heard you mention in an interview that you actually met up with John Singleton, did the consultation. Met up with him. We, we was working together. We, there you go. We was, we was considered friends. So I mean, I considered him a friend. I don't know what he considered. I mean, you know, a lot of times, you know, when, you, when you're doing business with people, what I've learned over, over the years, uh, even in the dope game, you know, the guy who set me up was a guy that, that I considered a friend. You know, I stayed at his house before. Uh, you know, I knew his kids, his wife, his 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 mom, he knew my mom. Uh, so I considered him a friend. But at the end of the day, when, uh, when he got arrested and he decided that he was willing to sacrifice my life for his life, uh, he set me up and then testified on me in, 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 in court. So I thought me and John Singleton was, was friends. You know, uh, No way that if I would have got a deal to do a show that I wouldn't have called John in to be a director. So when, when, when he got Snowfall, it was really hard for me to believe that, <clears throat> first of all, that he used so much of my stuff in Snowfall, and then that he didn't call me in as a consultant. So let's go through the history of you and uh, John Singleton. Um, when did you uh, meet him? I met John Singleton in 93, when I got out, the first time I got out of prison. I got out for like six months. So during that time, me and John had sat down. We talked about doing a movie at that time. Um, <clears throat> and I think he had uh, Boys in the Hood was out. Uh, he already did Boys in the Hood. Uh, he, he was already. Yeah, I think a few of them were. He was already kind of solidified in the L.A. Yeah, he, he had already kind of like etched himself in, 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 the, in the L.A. scene. So I felt that he was the right one to do it. And when I, uh, when I got back out the second time, you know, I, I really felt that. Because, you know, I talked to the, the, the Hughes brothers. Yeah, they you know, were. Uh, I, they, I wanted to do it with the uh, with the Hughes brothers. Society. I thought that they would be good to do it with too. You know, they from Pomona. I was right outside of L.A. And when I was in prison, we had a pretty good relationship. You know, we wrote and talked on the phone a lot about uh, what my movie looked like and 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 what it should be. Uh, but I felt John Stingleton was a notch above them. You know, when it came down to doing movies, especially when I got out, he had much more property than they did. And the, the Hughes brothers had kind of fell back a little bit on the movie business. Yeah, uh, um, I think um, they had fell out about something. Now, Albert, me and Albert really got along really well. The other brother was more, more standoffish, uh, uh, but Albert was super cool. Uh, I met with their dad when I got out, and one of the sons who was a director who also wanted to, to direct my, my piece, but I felt that John was a much better fit. 
you know, because he had did uh, a lot bigger movies at the time. And, and I thought that uh, he lived in L.A. Right, you know, you go. Right. He had lived in L.A. So, so I thought all that made, made a perfect fit. So, uh, you know, me and him had, had started, you know, started hanging out and started talking about the movie. I gave him the script that Nick Cassavetti had did. Uh, <clears throat> I, I thought about letting Nick Cassavetti direct it. I, I really liked Nick Cassavetti. Uh, we fell out because of the deal that, that, that Sony offered us. Uh, when I found out that Sony, Sony offered me 850000 and they offered Nick $2.5 million. Uh, so I thought, and they was giving him back in, 15% back in. They told me I couldn't get no back in. So I felt uh, uh, a little slighted by the deal, and uh, that did me even more so to John. So I, I got a question because I'm a, and I hate it because uh, I love the show. But when I heard about what they did to you, I feel some type of way. I have a question, like, for you, how accurate was the show to your life? Like, did they veer off the path, like, during a certain season? Or is it pretty much your story all the way through? Well, you know, in the beginning, it, it's, more, it's more to the real or the story. And, you know, I got a show called After the Snow. Where, where, oh, shit. Yeah, I go down every week, every, every time. Uh, it? It's a podcast. Yeah, okay. yeah so uh, every week I go on the show and I, I, I tell you, because I, I see what they're doing. They change my words around a little bit and, uh, and make it their words. Uh, but, but you can see in the beginning where it's really, really close and they, 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 they flipping it. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they trying to flip it. But I also can see when they start to run out of ammunition. Right. You right. know, John, uh, you can go on John Singleton's page. On his Instagram page, you'll see a picture of me and him. Right. He bought one of my first books. I got, I got 10 demo books. And <clears throat> when my documentary aired, you know my documentary was number one on Netflix for a year and a half. Yeah. Yep. So when it aired, when we did the pr- premiere, John went to the premiere with me. Ah. And at the premiere, he bought one of the first 10 books. I had 10 books and... Uh, there was demo books, you know, had demo wrote across it. Well, he wanted one of the demo books. And he gave me $100 for the demo book. And we took a picture together holding the book um, at, the, at the screening. And by me not going, I don't really go on Instagram, you know, and checking people's pages and all that. Somebody runs my page for me. Uh, <clears throat> he had a picture of me and him on there. And he said, Rick Ross, great story, snowfall coming soon. Oh, oh man. Where's the Lord's? God shit. damn. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's only, you know, that's only part of the evidence. But, you know, right. who else in the history of America had a case where the CIA was implicated and, in working in their case? And, and that's what I want to go, because if, if anybody watched the show, your character who is Damson Idris, he's killing it. I hate to, you know. And then there's a guy named Teddy. Was the CIA agent kind of like Teddy in real life, or is that just fabricated? Nah, that's fabricated. Okay, okay, okay. Um, you know, I talk about how Teddy is almost like a Superman. You know, he walks through locked doors and <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, just move around as you please. Yeah, yeah. He 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 he's just doing so much, you know. Uh, and, and even with Franklin, you know, I had I had lunch with Franklin uh, uh, right before the show aired. You oh, know, wow. uh, I was at Snow, I was at uh, Whole Foods one day, and and. Uh, having lunch and he walked up and he was like with his accent hi Mr. Ross and, yeah. and I didn't know who he was but uh, my people who were with me and they was like hey that's, that's the guy I play on Snowfall that's the star of Snowfall so I invited him to sit down and we, we talked for a minute and he talked about uh, how he wished that they would have had me on the set and that he was going to go back and petition for them to, uh, oh, to, wow. bring, to bring me on the set mm-hmm. Did he, do, did he do with that from your knowledge? Did he Well, you know, what what I found out about Hollywood is is Hollywood is is kinda kinda like I don't know, they're kinda like afraid of somebody that think like me. Mm-hmm. You know, uh I don't know if you watch Kill the Messenger. Yes, that was a good ass. Well, you know, that, Michael, that was kind of your story too, wasn't it? My story is in there. Yeah, you because know, that's the, the reporter that reported brought my that story. Actually, right. Well, you know, Michael K. Williams played my role in, inside that movie. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess Michael, he wanted to to be correct. And what he was doing, you know, he didn't want to be like the rapper and John Singleton. He wanted his history to be to be right. So uh, he called me and he was like, hey, man, I want to have lunch with you. So we go out for lunch and, and he was telling me, man, uh, 
this the show is coming out, Kill the Messenger. I already knew about the show already. Um, and and I won your role. And I want your blessings on, on playing the role. And um, I was like, well, why they didn't hire me on the set as, as a consultant if they're doing this movie? Uh, um, and, and my story, I, I knew more about Gary Webb's work than anybody else, because Gary come to the prison and, and tell me what's going on. And we talked on the phone about what was going on. So I told Michael, I was like, why would they be doing a movie and wouldn't hire me as a consultant? And at this time, I'm, I'm doing bad. You know, I just got out of prison. My mom losing her house. You know, house is in foreclosure. Uh, I could use a little money. So he, Mike was like, well, man, I'm going to go talk to him and see if we can get you a gig on, on the set. So he called me back. He's like, man, they said they don't want you. They don't have you in the budget. No money in the budget for you. <clears throat> so the first thing I tell him, I say, well, don't play my role then. Right. And so do you, not get, you don't get paid for your likeness on these shows? No, no, I, I haven't got nothing for none of these shows. How does it feel to keep seeing your story like be portrayed over and over again? Like, cause this this is not the first time. This, like, just in different pieces, like people telling your life, people you know are recreating benefiting. and benefiting, benefiting. <laughs> and you you know you're not one of the richest people. Cause I mean, even. You you could tell an individual who was playing you, they don't even have the same name, but you could tell like this is who this 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 is who this person is based off of. But yet you are not accredited for that. How does that feel? It it, it feels it feels fucked up. I'm gonna be honest with you, but it it just lets me know how Hollywood feel about us as black people. You know, yeah, I, and that that was going to lead to my next question because. I want to say that John Singleton may be able to fund, but is it really John Singleton or is no, that? No, he can't fund. John can't yeah. fund. Yeah. So who? It's who only would... it's only it's only maybe one or two black people that can fund the movie. Right. If if that. Right. You know, it, it may not even be them. Uh, I got lucky with my with my with the motion picture that that I ran in the Reginald Hutland, and and he was able to raise the money to to actually do it. But it's only a couple of people in Hollywood that can do that. Uh, uh, you would be surprised at some of the names of the people that I've talked to in Hollywood. And the first thing they do was trying to take me back to the same people I'd already talked to, right. you know, who I'd already walked out on. So, uh, uh, and, and, and since I've been doing after the snow, you know, yeah. I, I ain't as, as yeah. upset with John as I used to be. Right. Cause I, I, I used to be fierce with John cause he knew my financial situation. Right. You know, he knew that moms were losing the crib and, and all that. And, and, uh, for, for him, not to, to give me a job, but after I started doing this after the snow, I started to see a little more clear about what probably happened. You know, John probably went to him and said, look, man, I got the show, Rick Ross, blah, 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 blah. And I want to do the show. And they probably say, you know what? We want the show, but we don't want Rick Ross. And, and that's fine. But you would think there's a certain amount of integrity to where like, we don't need, we won't do the show then. We'll move forward to individuals who see our vision. You know? Well, that that's that's true too, but it should be like that. But then you figure a lot of these guys don't have; they need the money. Okay. You know, they 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 may not be as honest with me as I was with them. You know, he might not have told me, "Hey, man, my house in foreclosure too." Yeah. You know, I can't help you because I'm <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> yeah, you just got out of prison. You fucked up, but I've been out here and I'm still fucked up. So, uh, uh, you just don't ever know. And, and for my being around Hollywood and, and being around these dudes, Hollywood will take people and they put them on strings. And, and they have them doing what they want them to do and say what they want them to say. And it's really some little white guy behind the curtain, you know, holding all the strings. So you can't really look at it on face value of, of what position these guys are in. And, and, you know, I mean, you would wonder why we don't tell real black stories, you know, right. why nobody has ever told a real black story. And it's because we don't run nothing in Hollywood. Now, <laughs> would you jump in there and help them? Cause that last season was, it was bad. Uh, it was <laughs> would you jump in there man. if they said, man, Hey Rick, man, nope. they called me, they already called me. 
They, didn't hit me <laughs> they up. look like they ran out of material, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got a lion in South Central LA. Got, a guy got a pet lion. <laughs> pet a lion in South Central LA. <laughs> like, in South Central LA, this? man. Come on, man. Off the rail. Yeah, they they bodies, bodies. <laughs> I mean, that's what it really just turned into now. It, it, it almost what they're doing is is I feel like right now what they're doing is they're getting their material from the rappers. <laughs> ah, they, yeah, they, they turn on the rap records and they'd be like, oh yeah, we can make a scene out of that. There you go. And and, and the whole thing is just turning in, in the rap music, you know. So uh, they definitely need some help. You know, I'm glad this is gonna be their last season. Yeah. And then uh final season. But the good thing about it is that they did good numbers. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. their, their numbers was real high. That and, uh, that has given me the opportunity, you know, I have a couple producers that, that has contacted me about doing a series about LA. And uh, my series is going to be a, more about L.A. than, than just about me, uh, because there's so many other people uh, that, that I felt was significant uh, uh, in my success as well as is, is their own success. So um, I'm, I'm working on that as well right now. So when you got, when you got the news about the passing of uh, John Singleton and uh, also uh, Michael K. Williams, uh, like what do you what are your thoughts as far as when you see like an actor of such prestige, a director of such prestige, uh, when we're losing levels of that caliber of uh, you know? Michael, talent. I was I was sad to hear Michael die. John, I didn't care. Was that bad, huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was like he don't care about you. You know why? Why do same we? Same energy. Same energy. Why do we care about people who don't care about us? You know why do we? Why do we cater to people who, who, who don't give a shit about you? And, and if you don't like me, I don't like you. If you like me, I like you. Simple as that. Yeah. Uh, what would you say, what movie would you say closely depicts, not your life, but as far as the L.A. life and maybe either the gang culture, the drug culture, or just the culture of L.A., what movie would you say from your experience has closely Well, you know, my depicted? partners did 100 Kilos. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's a low-budget movie. They only had about... Huh? No, no, this is about me. Oh, okay. No, they, no, did, no. they did a movie, but it was from my partner's point of view. Uh, uh, no, I mean, where can you Mike, watch it? Is it like uh, on streaming sites? It's on the streaming sites. It's out there. It done, it done did millions and millions and millions kilos. of views. Uh, it's called 100 Kilos. Uh, Rod Scott and Ali Newell did it. Uh, <clears throat> Rod was one of my little homies that was in the dope game when I went to jail. I talked him into getting out the game and going to film school at UCLA. And... Uh, they decided they wanted to do the movie. Uh, I signed off on it, and uh, they put it out. Um, some down, somewhere down the line, though, they, have, they got the fighting, and they wind up selling the, the footage to somebody else, and they put it out. But uh, it's out there, and, and it's, it's, there's, some, it's, there's some big numbers on the underground. Uh, what other movie? Boys in the Hood was close, too. You know, Boys, Boys in the Hood was close to L.A. story. And I'm not a big movie. I'm not a big movie fan either. You know, uh, one of the things I learned from 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 being in prison. You know, when I went to prison, I couldn't read, but I read over 300 books before I got out. And some of the greatest writers of, of stories say that you can't write stories when when you're reading other people's stories. So you know, I can't consume myself with what other people are doing and and, and not focus on mine. So most of my attention be focused on what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Uh, I spoke to Reginald Hutton like four or five days ago. Oh, and no. and uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. And I haven't saw my new script. We just we just had the new script doctor, just finished it. So it's finished now. Reggie's happy, uh Gino's happy. Uh so we're hoping to start shooting. He said, Man, your script is phenomenal. He said, You're going to knock the socks off of these people when when they see your story. So uh, hopefully here in the next couple months. You know, we'll, we'll be casting and, and trying to find an actor to, to play my role uh, and, and get this thing on the road so they can get the real the real story. For real. Yeah, we waiting on that. Now, how does a black man meet a CIA agent? Like, how does that even happen? Well, I, my guy, he wasn't a, he wasn't a CIA agent. He, he was what they call a CIA, a CIA operative. And the difference between an agent and an operative is an operative is from a separate country. And they are sent over here because their country has been taken over by, you know, somebody that, 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 that works against them. And he works with the CIA, but he can't be on the CIA 
he can't be a CIA agent because he doesn't have a green card. He's not a natural citizen. You can only be a CIA agent if you're a natural citizen. <clears throat> but an operative can get money from the CIA and, 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 and work for the CIA. So he was an operative. His, his handler was a CIA agent. So, so it's a little different. But when you look at it, it's all the CIA, you yeah. know, because they're responsible for whatever actions he take. But under, under the, the, the American laws, he can't actually uh, uh, hold the title of a CIA agent. Where do you bump into him at? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got to climb that ladder. You know, yeah. you, you, you climb it, you climb in that. You, you, when you start climbing the dope ladder, you start to, to meet higher and higher and higher people. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I just kept taking all my money, pulling it back into the game, you know, in, until I was to the point where I was buying $3 million worth of dope. And when you start buying that much dope, uh, people higher up want to come over and supervise and make sure that, that everything go the way it's supposed to go. Especially, right. you know, they're dropping this off in South Central L.A., yeah. you know, where, where, where people take a lot of this. They, you know, they take cars and, and rims and watches. So, you know, they thinking, you know, we're taking $3 million worth of dope over there. You know, they might do anything to us, you know, with that. So, uh they they started coming over, keeping an eye on on the whole transaction, and uh, I, I saw them. How much anxiety is involved with handling three million dollars worth of dope? Well, you know, when when, when you start in, when you start messing with dope, your your your, your tolerance. I, I look at selling dope almost like using dope. You know how they say a junkie? They start off with just a teeny weeny bit and it gives them toe up, and then they can gradually your tolerance start to go up. Well. And the same thing in selling it. You know, when I got my first eight, uh, that's what I started with, was an eight. I was scared to death. I was looking all over, peeking out the windows, and I thought people was following me. And then after I handled that eight a few times, I got relaxed. Then when I got an ounce, it was the same way. Then when I got a kilo, it was the same way. Then, you know, you're doing hundreds of kilos, and you just get relaxed, like, oh, man, the cops can't catch me. I'm going to smart them again today, you know. And... uh <coughs> The anxiety just starts to, to, I don't know though, you know, because uh, w- when I was selling dope, I used to, uh, I used to have an ulcer, you know, because I was probably wearing unconsciously and I, my, my, my tennis coach used to tease me because I'd walk around with one of them bottles of Malax in my back pocket all the time, drinking that Malax to, to, to relax my stomach because my acids wasn't mixing properly. And uh, the doctor said it was because I was worrying and I'd be like, I ain't worried about nothing, but unconsciously, it does affect you. So on Google, it says you moved $900 million worth in the 80s. Is that accurate or is it higher or less? It's probably higher than, than <laughs> what they said. My, 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 last two years being in, my last two years being in the dope game, I was making at least a million dollars every day. This is before inflation. That's the same. Hold on, wait. What's the copy shit you ever did, bro? With an M a day? You just got to be walking around like... <laughs> Well, all that was a profit, though. I only made, I only made like, for every million, I make like 200000 Sometimes, <laughs> Sometimes a little more. So, like, you know, if I did a day and I made like $3 million came into the house, I would make like $600,000. Or maybe a little more. Because, you know, it's according, it also is according to who came through the house. You know, there was guys that, that I might sell a kilo to, for 25000 And then there was guys I might sell it to for 20000 You know, but he might buy thirty at one time. So it, it, all that all that varied who it was, you know, what they was doing. And then, you know, I had spots, you know, I had like my own spots where I sold cut ups. You know, sometimes we make fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars just in cut ups, you know, 20s and 50s and hundreds. How so, many spots would you say you had in, or how many soldiers would you say was under you working for you at the max, at the height? I don't know. You know, one time they, they, they did a special called L.A. Gang Godfathers on us on CBS, and I think they had about 40 guys on, on the picture. You know, they had all our pictures up. I never sit down and count it. You know, <laughs> right. you're talking about a guy that was uneducated, you know, dropped out of high school, uh, uh, never read a book. So I didn't really keep up with the numbers. It was them as homies. You know what I'm saying? We all together, and we're going to be together forever. You know, that's what it was, and, and, and that's how I looked at it. So I never really sit down and say, oh, one, two, three, four, five. You know, we never did that. It was just... You know, this is what it was, and this is how we rode. Now, I'm pretty. I'm sure you thought you were pretty smart 
when you're out in the game, I would get making that much money. Of course. But when you went and sat down and really started educating yourself, how did that expand your mind? Well, I, I realized that I had, I had picked up some skills, you know, from, from the dope game. And uh, really, I, I never really had to sell dope. You know, I never really had to, or I could have sold dope and made my first thousand dollars and I should have been able to retire from that. Uh, but, you know, selling dope, you get addicted. You know, you get addicted to the lifestyle, the power, uh, being able to help other people, you know. Uh, uh, any of my family members could come to me, oh, my car just got repoed. Uh, uh, I'm behind on my house note. I got it. You know, you know what I'm I'll saying? Follow. We're going to get that back. <laughs> so all that becomes addictive, you know, being able to, to, to assist your family members with, with their problems uh, uh, is part of what pushes you back into this game. Is that and power that's addicting? Power is addictive, absolutely. I'm, I'm still hooked on power. I just had to switch up what I was, yeah. what I was doing to get the power. <laughs> But I still like the power. <laughs> you know, I, I make a joke about all my friends. I tell them about the big stick. You know, you, you walk around with this big old stick in your hand, uh, uh, and, and you use that stick to whoop everybody in line. And, and that's the power. You know, that's that stick. Who was that one family member that just would always come and have a problem, no matter, regardless of what you gave them, how much you helped them, and they just, they just had something new going on in their life every day? You said the, the one family, family member mm -hmm. that, that would always have a problem? Yeah, some, an issue or something going on in their life. I, mean, I had a bunch of them, man. You know, right. I got a big family. You know, works. You know, hey, you know, my grandfather, he practiced, uh, uh, he practiced a form of slavery, is what I call it. Um, he had 24 kids. Because he, he liked the people that could pick cotton. Oh, damn. So he was trying to build a farm. <laughs> No, he, was he, was, trying, he did. He did. He did. He did. He did. So uh, I had a lot of family members. I had a lot of family members that was on drugs. You know, they, they was affected. Some of the first people who got affected by drugs because they was right there with me. You know, they, they started off trying to sell, or at least they pretended like they was trying to sell. But in actuality, some of them had uh, fell victim to, uh, to using. So I had quite a few. But I got an uncle that... You know, he's 80 something years old. He's, he said the only thing he don't like about, I dislike about cocaine is that it ain't big as an elephant. So, uh, you know, he, he always been my mama's wild, wild sibling. And uh, still to this day, you know, I still have to look out for him right now today. He come over and, nephew, you my favorite nephew. Give me some money. <laughs> bring, bring it. Bring it. <laughs> now, I got to ask you, um, you know, with the crack epidemic coming in, um, you know, do you ever sit back or do you ever think as far as, um, or I would just ask, how much devastation do you feel like, you know, you might have involved yourself into the L.A. scene, the South Central L.A. scene? I was big in it. You know, I made it fly. You know, um, I made it to where the young guys who came up after me, you know, uh, uh, the young Tommies, the Bo Bennett's, all those guys who came up after me, they liked it because of the way I made it look. So... I played, I played a major role in it. You know, L.A. Times said I was the first crack millionaire uh, in the country. And, uh, you know, uh, but, but you, you know, when, when you really look at it, you know, somebody else asked me something similar to that, right? But they did it more, more forcefully and more, you know, like trying to get at me about it. And, and uh, what I tell them is that in this game, you can point the finger if you want to at some some body or some person, but then when you do, you have to keep going down the line to figure out how did that person get turned out? Because at one time, I knew absolutely nothing about cocaine. But then somebody took me and showed me how to do what they showed me to get me started, and then the ball started rolling. So uh, it's a lot of people that, that, that bears uh, responsibility for, for the crack epidemic. Do you feel like that was the reason that you were able to do so much good because of maybe s some devastation that you might have caused. It helped you to be able to do good with it, either your family or friends or other people involved in your community. Well, I try to do good because when 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 I was when I was down and out, uh, I wanted somebody to help me. So I feel that we should help somebody. You know, it's it's like 
not being able to see somebody who who is really trying to get their shit together, yeah. you know, and 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 you don't try to give them a hand. I, I believe that we should give people who are really genuinely trying to do the right things. We should help them. Uh, Charles Cosby um, was he on your like was there a relationship or was he before or after you uh, Griselda Blanca's ex dude that they portrayed in Cocaine Cowboys too. He was after me. He came in the 90s. I was already in prison in the 90s. Did you ever... Um, Gazelda? Yeah, did you ever have yeah. any... I, 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 I knew her. her. Uh, my guys, my, my operative, knew her, and, and they associated with each other. But I never, I never dealt with her directly. What are your thoughts as far as on today's uh, drug dealers, <laughs> drug society, uh, just the drug culture? Of today, and it's a totally different game. But what's your thoughts on it? Well, you know, I mean, really, what they're saying is a drug of choice right now is fentanyl, and, yeah. and it's hard to believe that people would sell their customer a drug that would kill them. Right. That's true. Uh, like you want them to go a little crazy. Nah, company. you don't want your customer. To, I mean, when I say go crazy, I mean go crazy when, over when the, I sold drugs, the high. When I sold drugs, I wanted the money. Right, right. but they got to come back though. And, and yeah, but I actually try to get all my customers to become sellers. Oh. Because if they're sellers, they make more money than, than, than a buyer. You know, a person can only spend $100 every day so long mm. if, they, if they're using. But if they if they selling, you can sell $1,000 worth of cocaine every single day, right. you know, or even more if you, if you really get your stuff together. So I always try to encourage my people to not use and to, uh, uh, and to uh, sell. And I've never given anybody cocaine for their first time. Uh, fin -all, the fin -all no, I never start nobody off. I, oh, I, I, I right. never, like, hey, come, like, come, in, first, come in my room. Let me change this just right. Is okay. yeah, that's, that's, I, I think the weed myth is, 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 is just a myth that, that, that society put on us that, you know, you start with weed and you gradually go up to something heavier. I started with cocaine and I went down the weed. So, uh, mom, yeah, man, see, yeah, no, that's facts. I started, I started heavy. It came back down. Is there like a freeway? Because dispensaries are legal now. Do you got your own strand of weed? I got my own strands. I got a dispensary. What's it called? Uh, I got two two different brands. I got LA Kingpin. Uh, <laughs> LA is, Kingpin, is which mine. is all mine. Yeah. And then I got a freeway, which I partnered with somebody. And I got I got about two or maybe three more brands that, that I'm also working on. Uh, I'm in right now. I'm in four states. I'm in Boston, Ohio, Arizona, California. Uh, I'm talking to people right now in Oklahoma. Eventually, uh, my plan is to have the biggest marijuana brand in in, in the country or the world. That's right. Uh, LA Kingpin. Yeah, LA <laughs> I was watching it. I was watching like a YouTube top twenty kingpins all time. I think you came in at like number five or some shit, and you was like the only. Black, black person on that motherfucker, like yeah, yeah. I seen it. I seen that they, it was trending the internet one day. Uh, I saw that too. I, I don't know. You know, I don't really rank because I, I didn't really keep tabs on you know what I did. You know, uh, that was the government's job. They they keep tabs on everybody. They tell you how much dope you sold and how much money you made. So uh, if they put the numbers out there and, and that's what they say the numbers are, that's what it is. Do you ever feel like you have to shy away from your past life, like? Is it too distracting sometimes? Like, you be trying to get some real business done and people want to ask you about dope, 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 dope? No, nah, it don't bother me. Uh, I mean, I've answered, you know, the questions about it so many times. But at the end of the day, you know, my past is my past. And my past is really what's going to justify my future. You know, because once you know where I came from, when you see where I'm going, then you're going to respect it even that much more. And we're definitely going to touch on what you have, you know, going and coming. Um, uh, the Barbara Bush uh, say no to dope war on drugs. Uh, don't George Bush. Uh, you weren't you? You were locked out at the time, or were you? Uh, no, I was out for that. You was out for that. What are your thoughts on Barbara Bush? Well, you know, uh, what the I war said. on drugs. The U.S. You know, they just really kind of came in with the whole <laughs> thing. I said, Barbara Bush said, just say no, and her husband said, act like you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> act like you don't know for real. For real. Do you feel that was effective as far as, um, you know, a lot of kids, uh, they put a, you know, it was, in, it was involved in a lot of programs to say no to drugs era, you know, and, um, you know, I feel like that might entice some kids to figure out what the monster is. Like, oh, what is that? I'm, I'm curious, like, what, 
Did you see that? Like, in well, Atlanta? you know, if you look at some of the commercials that they used to do, you know, like um, George George Bush, the commercial he did in the White House one time, and he was saying, "You take this little bitty rock, and you can make thousands of dollars." You know, <laughs> and make people want to find out. You mean that yeah, little, like rock? That little I can make a thousand dollars? You see that? I want I want some of that. So <laughs> a lot of their commercials was could could be considered counterproductive, you know, because of they could have been promoting instead of actually dec- de- uh, 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 decreasing the, the desire to get involved. Now, outside of, um, you know, L.A. Kingpins and Freeway, um, of course, after the snow, uh, you know, the podcast, you got a lot of other business ventures and dealings going on. Um, uh, Freeway Ricky Records, uh, I believe, um, you know, you're into the, uh, the boxing game as well. Uh, touch on, like, some of not only that, but also some of all your ventures, if you... What a boxing. Yeah. I'm really excited about boxing right now. Let's talk know? about it. <laughs> I, I got my man, Anthony Peterson, here with me too Anthony today. Anthony Peterson, the dough, he in the yep, building. Yep, oh. yep. So uh, we just got a win last night, Kid Austin over at uh, uh, the Dickey Arena. Congrats, uh, six for round, real. Six round knockout. Uh, boxing to me is, is kind of like one of those businesses where they need me. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think that the, the fighters have been, been getting treated fairly. Uh, uh, I you mean, think, on business end, they need you. Or as far yeah, as on the just, business, yeah, I can't train them now. <laughs> I mean, more so like as far as bringing a, a name to the sport, like you know, you all that. Go, I can bring a name. I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna help them with their marketing. Uh, uh, but one of the most important things is their business aspect. You know mm-hmm. that they just don't. The people who who run boxing right now just don't take care of business the way that that it should be taken care of, and they don't teach the fighters how to take care of business or or tell them that they should be taking care of business. It's kind of like they they kind of keep. They they enjoy keeping these guys in the dark so that uh, 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 so that they can take more of their money, you know. They can get more of the money for themselves, you know. Uh, when when you don't know, then you can't do better. So uh, what I want to bring to the table is where these guys are able to take care of their own business, uh, handle their own money, you know, get your own checks. Why why is somebody else holding your money for you? You know, Mike Tyson, when, when, when I did the Mike Tyson show, he tells this joke of uh, Don King buying $20,000 worth of towels. You know, one of my guys who went with me to the interview, he was like, Mike, what about, what about the story about those towels? He said, damn, Don King. My <laughs> <laughs> fucker bought $20,000 worth of white towels. The hotels give me the towels for free. And so when you see people doing... People like that, you know, you, you want to step in and, and, and say, you know what, I want to stop that. You know, I want, I want these guys to be able to, to, you know, they're taking all the risks, they're taking all the chance. Every time they get in that ring, you know, they're putting their life on the line. And nice, uh, nice. they should be rewarded for it. And, and nobody else should have the right to uh, come in and, and, and take their money because uh, they don't understand the business aspect of the business. Was that from a particular book you read as far as getting into boxing and the business behind it, or you just kind of learning as you go as far as the actual boxing business? Um, I, I read a couple of books on, on boxing, you know, when I was there. Uh, but, it, you know, business is all business. Once you, once you know the basic principles to business, uh, um, then you can't win. I mean, you can't lose. And, you know, one of my main principles is, is people. You know, put people first. Definitely. I got to ask you on. Um, you know, there's always been this, uh, you know, from the kids today, they only know mostly of one Rick Ross at a time. They didn't know there was another Rick Ross. They didn't know the history behind uh, the artist and the rapper Rick Ross. If they had, uh, you know, that there was somebody that came before that bought, that garnished that name. Um, what is that as far as um, that is, uh, you know, the Rick Ross as the rapper borrowing from your name and your likeness to personify his rap career? Or is that something totally separate? Or, I mean, what's the history behind that in itself? I don't understand really what the question is. Right. I, I guess you're saying him taking my name, using it. He took a name that he knew the streets had love for. I see. See, I had love. Like, before NBC, CBS, before any of them knew about me, the streets already had love for me. You know, the, the boot noses out of Dallas and, you know, the J Prince's out of Houston. We all knew each other. We all had love for each other. And when, when the streets had that kind of love for you, the rappers find out. 
You know, they're some of the first people to find out about that, and, and he took it and he capitalized on it. Based on that alone, as far as, uh, you know, him taking the name, um, at the time of, I can't, and again, I don't know the, the dates and when he came out and things of that nature. Uh, what do you have to like stand on that legally? 2005, as, he came 2005. out. Okay. Um, he told me himself. Oh, man. So that was a conversation afterwards that you had with him about when I was him. in prison. Oh, man. See, I, I found out about him when he, when he first came out in, in uh, uh, XL Magazine, because, you know, I had a book club inside the prison. So I had about 15 to 20 guys that, that studied with me in prison. We all studied. We read books together. We planned on doing business together when we got out. So one of the guys came over with uh, XL Magazine. And he showed it to me. And uh, I'd already been in, into the music business anyway. You know, I, I was doing music before I went to prison. And... Uh, I just got on the phone because I knew somebody I knew was, was going to know him. And I just started calling everybody I knew. Hey, man, who know this guy, Rick Ross? And then I called up one of my guys who used to write for Smooth Magazine. Uh, and I was like, man, uh, I'm trying to find this guy, Rick Ross. Who knows him? He said, oh, man, he'll be, in my, he'll be in my office Monday at 9 o'clock. Just call. So he called, called, he put him on the phone. And dude just started telling me, you know, his whole little spiel. You know, this is when he didn't have the bodyguards and... Right, 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 so right. Was a, he was a different guy then. And once again, you know, the lifestyle you really live, the, your name, the, the whole thing that you, it's in a lot of this music. And when you see that, like, how do you feel, you know, seeing your life being portrayed through people's music? Well, you know, we was young when we, when we started doing what we did. Uh, and we did it out of ignorance. You know, we so dope to our people out of ignorance. Uh, so I understand that a lot of rappers, when they rapping what they rap, they rapping it because they don't understand the effect that they have it on their community. Uh, so it, it's not it's not something to be glorified, you know. But you still got to understand uh, where it's coming from. Now you've had there's certain individuals who would say maybe that Ice Cube wasn't a real street dude, but he portrayed it well in music. Do you feel like the one that portrays the music but isn't really living that is more harm, doing more harm than, one, than the ones that really live in it and really rapping it? I think so. Right now, you know, you turn on almost any radio and they're talking about glorifying drugs, killing, murder, mayhem. TV, too. I mean, look at all the hot black TV shows. Mm -hmm. Big Meech, mm -hmm. Snowfall, and Power are the biggest TV shows on TV, and those are all street-oriented themes uh, uh, which I don't know if they all truly portray with what the street life. We know Snowfall is definitely, you know, definitely not a true uh, reflection of Los Angeles. It's not the way uh, it went down. It, it's it's not the culture, uh, totally opposite of what 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 really happened. Even with the feds now, if if you go to the feds and you can pull up, because they kept they keep stats on everything. What the feds found out. They thought at first that drug dealers was violent. And like when, when I first went to prison, they, they got what they call a black box. I was black boxed everywhere I went. That means that they put handcuffs on you and then they got another black box that they put across your hands. They cuff your hands to, to, your, to, your, to your side where you can't move and you're shackled. Uh, normal people are just handcuffs. You know, they, they can play with their hands, and do all kinds of things with their hands. But when you're black box, they take all of that extra movement away from you. And they said that they was doing that because we were considered uh, uh, dangerous uh, inmates. But later on, when all the studies came out, they found out that it was totally the opposite of what they were seeing. Drug dealers, the big drug dealers especially, wasn't necessarily violent. They do have some that, that, that's violent inside, but most of them wasn't. Do you feel like um, black entertainment will ever get back to a place to where, like, the Cosbys and the Fresh Princes of Bel Air, are, because right now it just seems like it is very supercharged with like drugs and violence. Well, I think I think the whole culture of 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 of, of black people is starting to change. You know, we're starting to understand that we can't keep going down the same paths we've been going down uh, with our, with our knowledge and, and with our finances. And I can see I can see change coming. When you look at a situation uh, in Atlanta with the YSL, uh, the RICO charge that they're putting on them, which is a state RICO, 
compared to the way, um, you know, they ended up, uh, you know, where you had to uh, go to prison as far as what they had on you, uh, where, you know, someone was able to, you know, get on the phone and, you know, talk, you know, say things that kind of got you jammed up. Uh, what are your thoughts as far as on the YSL situation? I believe uh, there are stories where there are cell phones that got planted by the feds to put into the security guards' hands at the jail to give into, to give the inmates who were still talking on the outside to kind of bring it in. Now, mind you, this case is ongoing and things of that nature, but what are your thoughts on the, fed, the federal government's tactics to try to bring RICO cases onto uh, artists or whoever individuals? Well, they don't, well, the feds don't really need much evidence. You know, uh, I, I somebody had asked me about that before. What did I think about them using their rap music to to convict them on? And I was like, well, really, that that is a lot of evidence because if they would have ever got me on the phone talking to somebody, you know, I could have been talking about carburetors or you know chickens or you know we used to try to use codes and they would take that and put it in court and use it as evidence against us. So if I would have ever got on a tape and said, oh, I just sold a hundred kilos. You know, right, that right, definitely right. would have been evidence against me in court. Mm -hmm. So if you go by the law, then they could use that as evidence against them. So what you're that. saying, and this is a cautionary tale, even rappers who are either active or were previously active with maybe open cases, um, words that you put on, whether tape and a documentary and a book, uh, music, can be used against you if they're building a federal case or just any case. Right, because all the feds need to do, they don't, they don't need no dope. You don't have to get caught with drugs. You don't have to get caught with no money. All they need is somebody to come in and say, me and him had this amount of dope this day. And if the jury believe him, then they can convict you. So there's another, there's another black kingpin, uh, Big Meech, that's, you know, they have the BMF TV show and things like that. Did y'all ever cross paths or did you ever? No, I heard about Meech when I went to prison. Uh, we started communicating after he got arrested. Uh, a lady by the name of Wendy Day asked me if I would assist him in, in his case. And she started sending me stuff and corresponding our letters. So we wrote back and forth through the mail. And uh, you know, I told him about what I thought about his case, how his case looked, stuff like that there. Uh, but we never met in person. Uh, you have any other business with Wendy Day? I mean, she was really big in the music industry as far as putting a lot of things together and, you know, plays for it. Yeah, Wendy is one of my teachers. She uh, she taught me the music business. Yeah. Uh, she bought me books while I was in prison. She be going viral too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we emailed constantly every day about, you know, what, what she was doing and, and how if I got out and when I got into the music business, how I should attack the music business. So, uh, Wendy is, is, is a very, very good friend of mine. Somebody I hold really dear. Matter of fact, I gotta do one of her artist's videos. I'll be playing tennis with one of her artists. I was supposed to be playing tennis with him today. Oh, wow, oh, oh, you still dabble in the tennis? In the, well, in the... Yeah, a little, yeah, I still play. Oh, man. But he wants to be on his music video, he wants to be playing tennis with me. That's kinda dope, no, I can't, I can't wait to see that, I can't wait to see that. Um, upon your last time getting out, man, uh, who, who picked you up, man? And what, you know, what'd you do on the, you know, did you look back? What'd you do on the, your last day that you actually had to sit down that you, when you got out? Out of prison or, or out, out the prison. halfway house? Because uh, I didn't go from, I went from prison to the halfway house. Okay, okay. And I would say uh, out, of, out, of, out of the halfway house, because, you know, some people can't really Boy, move around. Boy, Mayweather picked me up. Oh, damn. Boy, so, man. wait, wait, Mayweather was in communication with you as far as um, uh, when you got out? Hey, I'm gonna come get you, or did was it like a surprise? Like, hey, who's, well, who's getting got, it? When I got to the halfway house, it was you know like I, I used the dudes in the prison. They helped me, you know, whatever business that I was going into. Like, I would get calls from prison. They'd be like, "Hey, go meet my homeboy, such and such and such. He gonna do this for you. Go meet him. He do this. This one do that." So one of the homies was like, "Hey, uh, you want to meet Floyd Mayweather?" And I was like, "I don't know no Floyd Mayweather. Who is that?" And he was like, "Man, he the best boxer on the planet." And I was like, yeah, hell yeah, I want to meet him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he picked up the phone, he called Floyd, he put Floyd on the phone, we started talking. He was like, I'll be there for you when you get out. So uh, when I got out, uh, Floyd picked me up. We went, went to Hollywood. He had the Maybach and the Hammerhead, uh, uh, Rolls yeah, Royce. Yeah. Right. We shot the videos and, you know, we did the whole little, little nine yards. And I'd already wanted to get into boxing anyway. Exactly. Yeah. 
So uh, I felt like, damn, money hit the jackpot. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> Get with the, with the money team. I'm with the best right off the top <laughs> of the bat, you know? Yeah, so uh, I thought we and him was going to be doing some business with, in the boxing, uh, but it didn't work out that way. When you got out, like, did you have any money? Did you stash any money? Or I had $200. How does that happen? From a million a day, did they take everything or like? Well, you know, when you're in jail and, and when they put in the newspaper, you're getting a life sentence without the possibility of parole, people start saying he don't need that. So that kind of tell you how it goes. You know, Damn, when, you, when know. you don't need it, they need it. Damn. So everything become theirs. If somebody got something that's in their name, then it's theirs. Damn. They cut the grass. One of my uncles told me, man, I cut that grass every day. That's my house now. It's all, yeah, it's our house. Oh, shit. <laughs> Damn, it's, it's ours. Shit, shit man, it's, it's part of my house now. Oh, shit. What made you not be on no greasy shit when you got out? <laughs> yeah. Because frankly, you know, <laughs> I had a plan. Oh, okay. You know, like I said, I read over 300 books before I left prison. And uh, I mean, I predicted all this stuff before. I mean, if you get a chance, go read the, the article I did in LA Magazine, the one that's called Rick Ross is Dreaming. Uh, the guy from LA Magazine is writing my obituary, and it's, it's crazy. He talks about it in there how he thinks I'm delirious. <laughs> Why did you say that? Why did you say that? Because Just... I'm telling him, you know, uh, I'm finna do boxing, I'm finna do music, I'm gonna have books out, I'm gonna have documentaries, I'm gonna have movies, I'm gonna be telling politicians what to do. By the way, I'm, I'm lined up, I'm going to Mississippi in a couple of weeks. I'll be sitting down with the whole. Uh, city council and, and, and the state representatives, the guy who wrote the bill for that marijuana bill, yeah. uh, he wants me to come down and help them start a social equity program. Uh, I kind of become like the face of social equity throughout, oh, throughout the dope. country very for, dope. for why they're not letting blacks get licenses. So, Oh, uh, yeah. No, it's uh, not only licenses. So getting... That's me telling the politicians what to do. There you go. No, <laughs> running run that narrative, for real. Um, now, I just need your thoughts. Uh Ricky, in regards to, um, there's a story that goes out with uh, Birdman's half-brother, man, Terrence Gangster Williams. He did an interview with Vlad. He says that um, he got less prison time by uh, giving, you know, closing some cases and, you know, basically telling on the dead. Uh, he basically knew about some bodies that some of his dead partners had might have had, and therefore he told uh, the laws what they need to know to close those cases to put those bodies on dead men. Um, and therefore got a lesser sentence and was released. Um, is that considered snitching? Is that, is that, what, what is that in your world? I don't know, man. Gangster is a real gangster, man. He do what he want to do. You know? <laughs> Talk about yeah. it. Talk about it. In the pen, he ran the pen. You know, when he was on the street, I heard he ran the streets. And, and you know, I like gangster. That's my guy. And I have to ask, um, because... And I still speak to him. He called me, you know, he called oh. me a couple weeks ago. So if he called oh, me again, dope. I'm still going to talk to him. Uh, I don't feel nothing... You know, I don't feel nothing wrong with what he did. I mean, uh, he didn't hurt nobody. That was and his thing. I, no one's, no one's, in, you know, no one's hurt here. And you know, gangster done hurt a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah what, 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 what I'm doing here, no one, no one, no one's hurt here. Exactly. So, do you think the internet just because you know, like they put out these stories and then you you hear these people taking shots at real killers, like they, you know, like they pussy or something? And it's like the internet got a, a lot of things. Kind of fucked up. So how do you take it? You know, I don't know. I try to stay out of that kind of stuff. You know, my, uh, I'm right now I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, like I said, gangster, my guy, you know, uh, uh, hell of a dude, wrote, wrote some great books. You know, I read a couple of his books when I was in prison. Uh, and I, I wish him the best, man. And there was a there was a code back in the day or again, you know, you can let us know as far as from when you came up. Um, we have guys uh, that, you know, Basically, whenever someone gets reprimanded by the laws and someone does go tell and, you know, the word snitch, um, it's, it doesn't seem to be as strong, strong of consequences nowadays uh, for those who snitch and tell and talk to the laws and go from there. Uh, you have, of course, uh, you know, the Alpo situation and Takashi 6 9 um, Back in the 80s, was there like harsher consequences in the streets whenever word got around that someone might have... Uh, cooperated with police. Was it like just known that there's a harder consequence? It's according to who you're dealing with. In prison, it's a hard consequence. Yeah, in prison, in prison, you know. But in prison, if you say he a snitch, you got to have some proof. You mm -hmm. know, you got to come up with some hard evidence. Otherwise, they they're gonna punish you. So it's it's used really lightly inside the prison system. 
uh, and you usually try to stay away from I mean, unless you're a confrontational dude, you try <laughs> to stay away from those type of situations because, you know, in, in those type of situations, somebody could get hurt. Did they have paperwork parties while you were uh, in there as far as everybody's, hey, you know? Yeah, I heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't quite see too many of them. I heard of them. <laughs> Definitely, man. Uh, that's really with the gang guys, you know, who, 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 who didn't have nothing to do. They don't have no future. They don't know what they're going to do yeah, with right. themselves. So they're going to they gonna monitor the penitentiary. But you said somebody told on you. Your friend told on you. And that's how you got caught? Yeah. Damn. Damn. Uh, you know, I just had one question off of the Vlad interview you did, man. You said you had a cousin out of Texas that had 14 kids in L.A. Um, and that's one thing that really stuck with me, like, you know, that he was from Texas. He went out to L.A. to, uh, you know, you know, get in business with you. And then he just went out there and ran amok. Hey, a country boy, you know, he, yeah, like, what? he come from East Texas with no shoes on. And, and you know, <laughs> now he in California. And, and you was know, it something in the air? Was <laughs> powers, powers is, is, is uh, intoxicating. Mm. You can get intoxicated with that power. No, def, definitely. Um, are there business ventures that you have not gotten in? I know you had mentioned, uh, you know, of course, things you want to do and, you know, uh, documentaries. Uh, is there anything that you have not started dabbling in? Uh, we talked about an app that, you know, one of your uh, people are working on, which are you into, like, other things like that, apps? Um, I'm definitely into technology. Okay, okay. You know, all the rich people do, do technology now, so. Oh, tech world, yes, definitely. So I try to surround myself with all the smart tech guys, uh, they really hard to get to though. You know, uh, a lot of the big companies now they grab the black tech guys and, and they hold them tight. So you know you gotta you gotta break through. But I, I'm 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 making some headways in the tech world now. I got a couple couple guys that's, that's pretty sharp. I, I was messing with uh, <clears throat> the guy that was helping Nipsey. I can't think of. He got one of them African names, hard to pronounce. But uh, I was messing with him for a little while. Uh, but I'm gonna break through in the tech world too. Yeah, Nipsey man, he meant a lot to. Uh the L.A. culture as far as what he was about to do. I know he had a spot that uh, tech people would go and work and kind of work on their craft, you know, and um, I think that was definitely dope what he was uh, tr trying to do for, uh, you know, the South Central area. Uh, I'm curious, man, if uh, Freeway Ricky Ross could go back and talk to his 20-year-old self, man, and give him some words of advice, what would you go back and tell yourself? Leave the dope alone. Leave the dope <laughs> alone. Damn. But it's like when, 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 when George Bush show you that little bitty rock and say you can make a thousand dollars off of this, when you see, well, like that is so enticing when you come from nothing and you have nothing. But if you're like, again, I know someone, one of your people's introduced you to it. So it was like, hey, I'm about to make some money. Was, is the money more enticing? No matter what, whether it was dope or. But when you, you broke, know. absolutely. You ain't got nothing to eat. Money is enticing. But once you get to where you're comfortable, you know, and then you got to know, you got to know where you at in life. You know, if you don't understand where you at in life, then you can't really make those decisions. So the really, really what you're saying is you feel like your time that you lost is more valuable than the money that you earned. Oh, absolutely. Again. If I would have worked at McDonald's the way I work and the way I save my money, I would have been rich. You know, you talking about you work 18, 19 hour days and you don't spend nothing. You know, when me and my partner first start coming up, our biggest expense every day was uh, a burrito at Taco Pete. He get two burritos, I get two burritos, they cost a dollar a piece. So we spend four dollars a day and you know we might make five hundred thousand dollars. So all that money went back into the game. So if you're working at McDonald's and you make a hundred dollars a day, you keep stacking and keep stacking and you learn how to take that hundred and turn a hundred into a hundred and twenty. And then you turn a hundred and twenty into a hundred and forty and it just keeps growing and keeps growing. As, as you keep stacking your money. So eventually, you're going to be rich. You know. Now, um, I'm looking at an article that says uh, you launched uh, Freeway Ventures. Um, it's an organization to help the uh, impoverished communities. Yeah. So uh, can you tell me about that? Well, Freeway Ventures is, is, is my cannabis. That's the parent company for the cannabis brand. Right. You know, so uh, what we plan on doing is raising money to help other people like right now, say like Chicago, there's about 20 blacks that want licenses in Chicago, but they can't open up stores because they don't have the money. And right. kind of what the white companies are doing right now is they're kind of like starving them out, not giving them the money to open up their stores so they'll sell their licenses cheap. Yeah. And then the black companies, <laughs> they ain't no better. Wow. Yeah. 
Now nah, I ain't gonna call no names because some of them is y'all heroes. Oh, 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 man. <laughs> man, I wanna hear names. <laughs> no, nah, I ain't gonna call no names. <laughs> I ain't gonna call no names. Uh, on the subject of cannabis, uh, just want your thoughts real quick with uh, Brittany Griner. She got nine years for cannabis oil in the Russian prison. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is that excessive? I think so. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, and she gave a reason why she had cannabis oil, and it wasn't, I mean, it could be whatever. I know the reason she gave, uh, whatever reason it was, it was. Uh, but she said definitely it has uh, rejuvenative uh, thing, uh, uh, things about it as far as, you know, to help with sore, you know, sores and things of that nature as far as cannabis used as anointment and medical uh, terms, um, you know, uh, you know, we'll, you know see, Russia, we'll see what happens. With Russia, that. a different country. Yeah, we'll see what happens with that. You know, they, they, they over there going. They <laughs> yeah, they got everything everywhere. <laughs> um, how would you like to be immortalized, man? We talked about, you know, life and death and things of that nature. Um, uh, and, of course, just, you know, just living in the moment. Um, how would you, uh, Pre-Ray Ricky Ross, would like to be immortalized, um, you know, going on forever? Well, I want to be at the top of the list of all the greats. There you go. You know, with the Muhammad Ali's, the Malcolm X's, the Martin Luther King's. You know, when I was in prison, I thought about that, right? And I was like, really, what you can bring to the game is more than what any of them brought to the game. Uh, you know, they brought religion, they brought sports. But what I can bring to the game is what I believe black people need most, and that's economics. There you go. Man. Ah, he said a handful right there, man. Uh, you know, and it's crazy because we talk about what can make society better, what can make our people better. And uh, one thing I hear that you're saying, and from what I got from this whole interview, is, uh, you know, you went in having not read one book. And then, you know, 30, 40, 50 books later, not only writing books yourself, but uh, you're almost like a wealth of knowledge. How important do you feel for our young youth to self-educate themselves? Pick up a Not just the youth, the old people too. Old people too. Talk about it. Yeah, we all have to educate ourselves. You know, uh, one of my teachers said that uh, knowledge is something that uh, you learn in school, but education is something you have to continue even after you finish school. So you have to continually learn the things that you don't know. I'm just curious, had you had the, the book knowledge when you were Free Ray Ricky Ross, how much crazier do you think it would have been? Ridiculous. <laughs> Ridiculous. I mean, even if I wouldn't have went to prison, you know, like... I mean, it's hard to top a, almost a billion dollars. Like, one of the guys I used to do real estate with right now, uh, I just got, got back in contact with him a couple weeks ago, and he's worth $600 million right now. Damn. Uh, so, it, it, the numbers would be crazy. And he's not even aggressive. I'm aggressive. I'm really aggressive in, in, my, in my tactics. Right. You know, I go hard in what I do, so... That's but it's going to be there now. I'm... I'm, I'm the, the, the wheels are turning. Yeah, know? it's like, man, like I said, you're a true hustler. Like, no matter what life threw at you, you figured out a way. So whenever you did get down and you had to regroup, what was it that, what was the venture that kind of got you back on track? When? Like you said, when you this got out of prison and you had $200 <laughs> and you, <laughs> like, what was the thing that got you back on track? Like, Man, I went on Joe Rogan's show and I, I was telling Joe that I was broke. And, you know, I needed some help. You know, I thought Joe Rogan being rich, you know, like you say you, you say you love me, you love my story, you like my hustle, throw me something. And uh You asked him straight up? Yeah, you can go watch the show. It's on, <laughs> it's on YouTube. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. You yeah. got it, you got it. And he told me I needed a t shirt. Oh wow. <laughs> That's what he told me. And uh I didn't pay no mind. I was hot when I left his show. So, but, but a couple of days later, I was walking down the street and this little white dude walked up to me and he's like, man, I heard you on Joe Rogan's show. I got a great t-shirt idea for you. And I was like, what? But I kept an open mind and I said, what's your idea? And uh, he said, the real Rick Ross is not a rapper. And I said, the corniest shit in the whole world to myself. <laughs> and then the kid say, uh, he said, I'll do everything. I'll design it for you. And I didn't even know who he was. I didn't know he was like one of the greatest graphic artists in, in the world. Oh, shit. <laughs> I didn't know he had sold t-shirts that sold 300,000 t-shirts and nothing like that there, right? So uh, I was like, all right, if you're going to do everything, I ain't got to do nothing. Go ahead. Let's do it. And so we did it. I signed a little contract with him and uh, he did the t-shirt. 
He called me, said, man, come by. I got some t-shirts for you. He gave me 100 t-shirts for free. And uh, I just started. I sold, a, I sold that first 100 t-shirts the same day. Okay, yeah. True hustler, man. Yeah. So yeah. that was like 25,000 t-shirts ago. Same price as t-shirts. So, so merchandising. <laughs> yeah, t-shirts was the first thing that I did to, uh, to get my money back on. And I took that money and I published my book because I already had my book wrote when I left prison. And it just, just kept rolling from there. Why do you remain, how do you remain humble in this? Because like, like you say, you see a dude and they talk to you and they tell you, you know, I really love your life story. And you're like, throw me some. Most men would be too prideful to ask anybody for anything, especially ascending from where you came from. Well, I was asking for a loan. I wasn't asking you to give it to me. Yeah. I just needed a loan. Oh, okay. You just gonna get it back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna give it back to it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm gonna get Floyd. Floyd gave me some money too. I'm gonna give that back to him. Yeah, give it to me. I, I don't, I, I can't. No, I'm gonna give it on. back to him. You gotta give it back where it came from. Yeah. You know, wherever you get it from, you gotta go back to that. Otherwise, you, you kinda like, you pull your, your, your root up. Yeah. So I don't wanna pull my root up, you know, the tree from the root. I wanna give it back to him. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, there was a long debate with uh, Jeezy and Pimp C about 17.5. Price. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the genesis of that conversation, but who, I heard who, who, who do you lean towards, Pimp C or Bun? Uh, geez. I don't know, according to what year. There you go. There you go. That, that, that's really what it is, according to what year. Uh, yes, you according know. to what year. You know, when I first started, the first kilo I bought was $48,000. Oh, you know, first ounce I bought was $3,200. First eight track I bought probably cost me about six or seven hundred dollars. Mm. So, you know, whatever year it is, it, it makes a big difference. You know, the last kilo I bought, I think I paid like 9500 for it. Clock to change. Amen. You got any shout outs? Uh, not really, you know. Uh, if I give somebody a shout out, then everybody else will be mad at me. Man, you didn't give me a shout out. <laughs> Right. I did all this for you. You didn't give me a shout out. <laughs> right. Joe like, nah, y'all got my man Anthony in here, though. I want you oh, to yeah, say nah. something to my oh, yeah. man Anthony. You know, you, y'all don't know who Anthony Peterson is. Yeah. Congratulations, Anthony. No, Anthony. no, Anthony fight. That wasn't Anthony fought last night. That wasn't Anthony fought last night. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was Kid Austin. Yeah. No, but Ann, Ann is, uh, uh, I'm going to probably get my first belt with Anthony Peterson. Problem. Come on, Ant. My bad. Yeah, come on, Ant. We talking absolution. Come on, come up here. Yeah, come over here, man. Y'all, y'all got to talk to my man, Ant. Ant got a hell of a story too. You know, him and his brother probably is. Yeah, Anthony, 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 and his brother probably is like. You know, I didn't even know when 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 me and Ant started doing business together. I didn't even really know. I didn't really know their story. Uh, mm. But him and his brother probably like. All the new boxers copied their style. You know, the, the, the Spences, the Crawfords, the, 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 the Haney's. I mean, everybody that we yeah. see, all these young guys that we see boxing right now, uh, most of them got their style from the way. Uh, uh, it was crazy just the other day when he, he just met Kid Austin for the first time, too. And Kid Austin and his dad was talking about how they studied his style of fighting. Oh, wow. So, so uh, when me and Ant started doing business together, I didn't know all that. But now that I found out, I mean, the other day when uh, Terrence Crawford saw him at the arena yesterday or the day before, uh, he, he looked at him like he saw a ghost. So oh, that, that. But we'll let you speak to Ant for a minute. But yeah, me and Ant going to get our first belt together. He corrected yeah, me. Sure. Yeah, Rightfully so. <laughs> Rightfully so. I definitely let's, let's see if we have Ant in frame. <laughs> Have him in frame. Yeah, just go up to Ann real quick, man. What's good? What's good with it? What's going on with you, man? Thanks. Bring the mic up. Bring the mic up. Let's, let's talk to you for a second. What's going on with you, man? Thanks for having me. Man, now I, I hear I hear you got some greatness just lying, lying within you to where a lot of people have studied, copied, might have got influence off your style and everything, man, as far as you and your people. Oh, no, that's not maybe. That's true facts. Talk about it, man. Talk about I it. I don't know if y'all know who uh, Lamont Peterson is, a three, three-time world champion, two different uh, divisions. That's my blood brother. We 13 months apart. Here's my current coach right now, four-time mm. coach. And um, I'm from Headbangers Gym. Been there, been there for 25 years. And um, people don't know that a lot of people came up to that gym and got the blueprint. I don't know if y'all know about a thing called Mumbo Sauce with DC. We got a thing called Mumbo Sauce. Okay. And we put it on chicken and everything. But these guys came from different cities and came to my city 
and got that mumbo sauce. I can name names right mm-hmm. now that's popular names right now that that will set it out their own mouth. Y'all boy Earl Spence, Earl after Spence, he defeated yeah. my brother, he went straight to social media and said, look, this is my favorite guy still. Mm-hmm. And the things that I did to him tonight, he showed me in a 2012 Olympic training camp. Facts. That's why. And um, Adrian Bronner, Robert Easton, uh, Javante Tank Davis, Jamil Heron, all these guys we had endless spawn sessions with. It was literally showing them, because we was older and more uh, seasoned than that, because we came out of the 2004 class. Yeah. And uh, we just been around longer than them. And they came up there and they got work. All right, and so what you got in store for us uh, coming up? What you got in store for the world? A lot. I got a lot. And it's, I'm just so glad to meet this guy, Rick, because yeah. I feel like he gave me that, that stage to expose myself as far as acting, boxing, modeling, and um, a little bit of com- uh, comedy. You know oh, I mean? yeah. And, um, yeah. You know, it's very big to brand yourself outside of your one singular sport or one singular entity, man. Um, uh, you know, branding is very big in this day and age. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. For those that do want to follow the fight that you have coming up, um, uh, follow your movement, follow everything you're doing. How can they get at you? Where, where, what's, what, what social media platforms are you on? My social media right now is uh, just Instagram, uh, Peter Anthony 808 And um, look out for me, man, because October 1st is either going to be we're going to make the announcement this Friday. Um, it's either going to be here in Dallas on the 1st of October or in D.C. And it's crazy because Dallas, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Let's yeah, get that out the way now. And um, that's what D.C. stands for, Dallas Cowboys, D.C. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's what they told me that. But real talk, yeah, that's what they told me. When I was in foster care, my foster brother told me that D.C. stood for Dallas Cowboys. And I went with that. And my loyalty won't allow me to switch over teams. So I had to stick man, with him. Man, this dude here, he's a genius. You know how he, he marked everybody's name in his phone? By their birthday. He know everybody's birthday, man. This dude keeps everybody's he was, birthday. He was singing uh, um, Brian McKnight earlier. And something just popped in my head. June 5th, 1969. Looked it up. It's facts. <laughs> Nah, we need you right after that fight. We need you back in here, bro. We need to hear your whole story, you know, to come up, man. Just make sure you bring some thing. tissue. <laughs> <laughs> like that? Like that? Don't, don't be hugging me, man. It's okay, bro. It's yeah. all right. <laughs> hey, bro. We, we, hey, man. We we our brothers in here, bro. Man, it's oh, our yeah, family. We're going to hug understand. it out. <laughs> and, uh, Freeway, can you uh, go and tell them as far as all the, whether it's websites, uh, how to follow you? Can you tell them as far as everywhere? that you could be reached um, or they could follow the movement and the brands that you're selling. So therefore we can make sure we push them to that. Yeah. If they want to get the book, they can go to freeway, Ricky, uh, doc, free at the books, the t-shirts. I'm going to start back printing the t-shirts too. And I'm going to start back with the, the real Rick Ross is not a rapper. I ain't printed in about four or five years, but I'm getting so many demands now that I'm going to start <laughs> back. I'm going to start back printing that. So, uh, they can get those at freeway, Ricky social media, freeway, Rick, Instagram, Freeway Rick Ross on Facebook and uh, TikTok Freeway Rick and uh, Twitter Freeway Rick. Hey, man, it was a real pleasure to have you, brother. Let's clap it up, man, for a real love, man. Rick Ross. Man, if you wasn't one already, you saw the real life street star. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> the big, the realest the street star. The original, the OG, goddammit, man. Freeway Ricky Ross in the building, man. We appreciate it. Thank you, all Shout out to Real Street Stars, nigga. Moolah.